I'm excited to introduce uh, what's truly one of the more impressive efforts the Atlantic Council has accomplished. It wasn't easy. It's the Global Energy 2050 project that examines the impact of future energy mix scenarios on geopolitics, energy markets, and geoeconomics. It does this by modeling the interactions of key drivers of energy consumption and production at country, regional, and global levels, and builds in scenarios to explore the geopolitical and market impacts across different timescales. So if this happens, what impact will it have on that? Uh, the model is uh, one of a kind. There are many energy models, as all of you who are in the business know. Uh, but none are built that have in quite the comprehensive way that we've built this one. And none of them have quite as rigorous of a geopolitical component, which of course is what the Atlantic Council focuses on. Uh, what excites me about this is it's not an academic exercise. Rather, the effort is to create a tool that holds the potential to shape policy solutions. So using the model, we can test policy options to figure out how to best seize opportunities and uh, minimize risks. Uh, this work demonstrates the capabilities of our Global Energy Center uh, under the founding director, Dick Morningstar, and its uh, wonderful uh, uh, director, uh, Randy Bell, and his amazing team. It also highlights the Atlantic Council at its best, weaving rigorous quantitative analysis with rich geopolitical expertise to yield insights that could have uh, real-world uh, consequences. Um, we couldn't have achieved this without the, uh, the support of any, which was instrumental not just in getting the project off the ground, but also in providing uh, critical uh, feedback every step of the way. So it's my pleasure to hand things off to Lapo Pistoli, and he's Executive Vice President for International Affairs, uh, and a longtime friend, uh, to talk a bit more about how this project uh, came about and what we've derived from it. Hi, Fred. Uh, thank you. Um, you know that the, the sub-headline of the project is uh, Modeling Under Deep Uncertainty, and that reminded to me uh, a novel written by José Luis Borges, uh, who dedicated one of his novels to uh, one of his ancestors by saying that he was living his life in a time of profound uncertainty. So with this sense of humor, I guess he was saying that uh, the deep uncertainty is the new normal. Uh, and we have to plan our activities in this new normal of deep uncertainty, taking into consideration, I mean, at least three pillars. Uh, the first one is about the traditional fundamentals of the market, supply, demand, and inventories, but everything is changing, either in uh, supply and demand. Uh, in supply, you see a lot of new dynamics going, going, uh, going to happen uh, within the OPEC, non-OPEC, within the shale revolution, uh, and you have to take into account the new energy policies of a country which are facing energy transition, so diversifying sources. Uh, in the demand side, you have to take into account of the economic cycle, which is going to be a roller coaster in the last few years, and uh, still taking into account the different, the different impact of the energy transition on, on industry. If you look at geopolitics, you have traditional uh, troubling countries, you have traditional choke points, but you have also a lot of uncertainty in, in new uh, regional theater of crisis. So it's very hard to foresee everything that, that is happening. And last but not least, you have, into, uh, you have to take into account the new role of the finance. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think that everybody can give you uh, an absolute correct numbers, but somebody, many analysts say today, that the, the ratio between the paper barrel and the uh, uh, actual crude barrel, which are traded every day, is, is 50 to 1. And this is a short-term site in an industry in which you need a long-term vision and, you, and you, you make long-term investment. So it's so hard to combine in a single model all of these variables. And we were excited to share this idea with the uh, Atlantic Council because we are trying to uh, make a model, a first exercise of a model, where you take into account many variables, uh, many sub-models, and what we are hoping is that this exercise, this first step of the exercise, can be, let's say, an open platform, so something that can be scaled up, in which uh, not academics as a theoretical model, but experts and other sources 
uh, can uh, plug in and give their expertise and uh, scale up the models, scale up the variables, because in, in this time, this uncertainty uh, could be, in a way, managed in a better way. So thank you for this exercise. We believe in it, and I'm very keen and curious to see how it's working this first step. Thank you. Thank you, Lapo. Thank, thank you, you so much. So thank everyone, you. I think you, you know me by now. I'm Randy Bell. Uh, this is uh, our colleague, Eric Freud. And um, Eric is at the Technical University of Delft and is really the, the brains behind the, the whole model. I. Um, uh, barely can add at this point in the day. Um, it's really, really uh, fantastic to finally be able to present this project in front of you. Um, it's really, it's been one of the, the uh, most challenging things we've done at the Atlanta Council, and I really need to thank uh, Gianni Di Giovanni, Gianni right there, uh, for, for coming to us a couple of years ago and, um, with an idea for a, a, quote, Wikipedia of energy. We had already started thinking about uh, putting together um, a model that uh, tried to look at the, the uh, how changes in the energy system uh, would impact geopolitics. There, there are plenty of uh, uh, models out there, uh, we, all, we all look at them every day, but what they don't necessarily do is look at the geopolitical implications uh, of any potential changes. Um, and we had met a company called Strategic Advisors for Transformation um, and Eric, um, and they had been doing some, some of this work and actually gave a presentation at uh, the Munich Security Conference where uh, my colleague Matt Burroughs uh, uh, met them um, and got very, very excited about the kind of work that they do. It's, it's, not, it's unlike uh, uh, anything else. Um, and, you know, uh, as Lapo said, the, the model is being built under deep uncertainty. Um, so, Eric, why don't you describe what that actually means in practice? Well, instead of just uh, reducing uncertainty as much as possible, or just uh, introducing some parameter uncertainties, what we do is... Um, include as many different types and as big uncertainty spaces as we possibly can in order to find out what policies really make sense if anything can happen. So uh, this is a completely different approach from what most scientists and modelers are actually doing. We embrace uncertainty and by doing so we can look at opportunities but we can also uh, get to much better policy advice in terms of robust policies. So what you'll see up here um, is the, the web platform that we've built. Um, you can see we have, uh, this is in our base case, you, we've selected um, India, and you can see um, you know, uh, key performance indicators, a, a high option, a low option, and an average. Um, and, and we'll go into more of this in a little bit. Um, but, but this is an interactive platform that we've put together. Um, and it's, uh, oh, this is the first version of it, but ultimately um, this is something that we'll be able to use um, and actually test ver various different policies online in real time. Um, so uh, this is just the front end, though. And um, m most of the work actually happened on the back end in terms of actually building the model. Um, and it was a, a process that Eric has described as one of the, the hardest things he's ever done. Um, and if you know uh, the Technical University of Delft, they have some of the best modelers in the world. So Eric, why don't you talk about what this all means? So this is a, a systems model connecting everything to everything. Um, it's a multi-scale model. There are 217 countries grouped in regions and then they interact at the regional level and at the global level and also f within these countries. Um, and so this, this would be a typical uh, country overview where you have on the right hand side uh, different modules for population, economy, government, uh, different uh, energy demands from different sectors. And um, then on the left-hand side, we have uh, the generation of electricity, but also uh, extraction of oil, gas, coal, and supply meets demand. And then uh, if a country cannot provide, then, uh, then of course, there's uh, demand for imports. And that's how it, it's all connected. Now, you see here a, a small general overview. I think by now the model has about 100,000 equations. Um, and every time we get a request for, uh, you know, a what-if question, uh, it's extending. So, um, yeah, this is the general overview. Can we go to the next slide? 
This is, for instance, just a little module that was added this week uh, to answer the what if question. What if the Brotherhood pipeline from Russia is actually uh, interrupted for whatever reason? Um, now, that you can imagine that that take, takes time. That takes more time than just answering the question. There will be, uh, you know, a uh, hundred uh, BCMA uh, off the market, and this is also an advantage because we really figure out what is going to happen. And if we don't know, then we will actually include multiple structures that are plausible, and then we explore what might possibly happen. So, and I think that's where some of the real value lies in this, is that in, when, when we ask a question, we, act, we really try to figure out what it means in detail. So we have uh, modeled out a few scenarios, and this is just the beginning. Um, but we have, of course, a base case. Um, we have a scenario uh, that looks at um, if the Brotherhood pipeline is cut off. We have a scenarios if there is conflict in the Middle East, and then a longer-term scenario uh, called going green. Um, this is, this is uh, essentially a scenario in which a number of policy decisions are made uh, in order to uh, really decarbonize the energy system. And so you can actually see we've made two versions of this, um, one with the U.S. Uh, making significant investment in nuclear energy, one without, and that's due to a bunch of work that we're doing in Washington on the future of nuclear power. Um, uh, which one are we looking at now with nuclear? Great. Um, and what you'll see, we're looking at China. And actually, if up there, just to show how it works, will you click on India, and then we'll go back to China, because I want to talk about China, but I want to demonstrate. Yeah, so it actually has m m uh, projections out for every country. Um, in a future version, we'll have projections where you can just click, and it'll show at a regional level and a world level. Um, we're still working on the, the computer, uh, the, the, the web technology for that. But let's go back to, to China for a minute. And again, this is just a preliminary version, um, the very first, first uh, opportunity where it all, all worked. But you'll see um, in the Go Green, that's the blue, on the, uh, on the right, and then the base case is the gray. So you have primary energy demand um, worked out so that in this, in, with these assumptions, you'll see that primary energy demand is actually a little bit lower. Um, and I think the, mo the, the really the telling one is in China, oil demand, so uh, next row down to the right, um, is significantly, uh, significantly lower. Um, and then finally, um, where is the, where is the, uh, scroll down on, on this, there is, um, keep going, uh, energy consumption per capita. Um, this is something that, that I think is, is, is very interesting, um, and we use this as a proxy for energy access. Um, so with these assumptions, you'll see that um, in this Go Green scenario in China, uh, there's significantly more uh, energy consumed, um, significantly more energy access. Um, we also, you'll also see uh, GDP up there, and, um, and, and that uh, GDP is roughly the same, just a little bit higher than in the base case. In terms of the, the geopolitical perspective, which we're really looking for, um, uh, we worked with Eric, and, and Eric did this in a, a number of different fashions, um, but we use these two as markers for, ge uh, for st stability. So GDP going up um, and energy access are two markers for, uh, for stability. Now, there's many other things that we can build into this. Eric has done a lot of work on migration, for instance. Um, we're not going to do that in this model, but, um, but it's the kind of thing where, um, as we develop, we can continue to ask these types of questions, and we hope that this becomes useful for uh, companies like any um, and for, for uh, individuals around the world who just want to think uh, about what decisions today, uh, how the decisions today can influence um, the energy system and the political, uh, the world of the future. Um, so again, thank you so much to Eni for, for uh, working with us on this project and supporting it. Uh, we're looking forward to really you know, developing this, um, expanding it, um, refining it, etc.